Now, if you can turn to Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse, we'll read verses 21 to 24. Today I'd like to address um, God's instructions for husbands and wives. Genesis chapter 2, uh, we'll start reading at verse 21. And Jehovah God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof in, in, instead thereof. And the rib which Jehovah God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken from man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, when we look at the scriptures, we already understand that God wrote his word in parables. Uh, that everything we read uh, has been designed by God to have more than one level of meaning. Uh, and also, when we, whatever we're reading, uh, we understand that the spiritual understanding uh, represents is represented by what we're reading on the literal text, which is, has a far greater meaning than what we can see on the plain literal text. The Bible calls this the spiritual meaning. So right from the beginning, we can see that the man and the woman were not created the same way. Okay, man was created out of the dust of the ground. The woman was created out of the flesh and the bones of man. Uh, but God doesn't explain to us here what that represented. As a matter of fact, it's not until we get to the book of Ephesians uh, that God uses the same language and he explains to us there uh, that this is used to illustrate our relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 30. Ephesians 5, verse 30, we'll read down to verse 33. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Okay, in a marriage, God has established the role of both the husband and the wife, and has given careful instructions in his word for each spouse to follow. Okay, these instructions, however, are looked at by many who profess to be Christians uh, as outdated or perhaps even as chauvinistic. They believe those instructions just no longer have any application with today's modern way of life. Uh, so they end up making and living by their own set of rules and instructions, but they still want to be identified as followers of Christ. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 16. There we read. And he said to the woman, I'm sorry, and unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So when it comes to the topic of submission and authority, uh, there seems to be various thoughts as to what exactly that means. Many people have taken offense to the Bible's command to the wife submitting to her husband and being under his authority. Uh, they feel this belittles the wife somehow. Uh, and some others, they perhaps make obedience to these commands conditional upon fair treatment by their husbands. Uh, yet these ideas are due to the misunderstanding of the spiritual truths that the scriptures teach. Okay, in Genesis 3.16, we read of God telling Eve that her husband is to rule over her. Okay, this word rule is Strong's number 49.10. And it means exactly that, to rule. It means to reign, uh, to have dominion over. Uh, but it isn't until we understand the spiritual picture of what God says here, or anywhere else in the Bible, that His words begin to make sense. Okay, the unsaved can't understand spiritual truths so they take it upon themselves to decide what still applies today and how they're going to apply it. Uh, but when the spiritual truth is seen, God's people um, 
and all passages that, that speak to husband and wives, then they can truly understand God's purpose for giving us these instructions. So that's what I want to examine today. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, we'll read verses 4 to 6. In Matthew 19, verse 4, there we read. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So the most important thing we need to understand is that our earthly marital relationship is, uh, is an outward display of our relationship with Christ. Therefore, every instruction we receive from God's Word regarding the role of the husband and the role of the wife is to be understood with the husband uh, being repre with Christ representing the husband and the body of believers representing the wife. Okay? And in God's eyes, these two become one flesh. That's why God created Eve the way he did. And that's why after the fall, submission was required by the woman to the man. Because the woman typified the bride of Christ, and the man typified Christ himself. But there's a lot more to this than just pointing out the authority of the man over the woman, or the authority of the husband over the wife. The role of the husband has to be carefully carried out in the life of each husband. Uh, towards his wife, as well as the role of a father to his children. Uh, because God has established the role of the husband to represent the role of Jesus Christ as the head of his bride, the eternal church. Let's take a look at Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 25. We'll read uh, down to verse 33. Ephesians 5, 25. There we read, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Notice in verse 27, uh, the reason that Christ laid down his life for his church or his bride was that he may present it to himself, a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. In other words, Christ is presenting us, the true believers, to himself as a holy bride by the laying down of his life. We turn to, keep your finger here, but if we turn to 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11.2 We read, For I am jealous over you with, a God, with godly jealousy. All right. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Okay, so here we read pretty much the same thing uh, that we read in Ephesians 5, that Christ is presenting us to himself as a chaste virgin. The word chaste is Strong's number G53 and it's also translated as pure. Okay, And this word pure is also a word that God uses to describe himself. Let's take a look at that in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. We'll read down to verse 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he, meaning God, is pure. Okay, so we know how God has loved us and what he's done in order to present us to himself 
uh, as a pure bride. But if we turn back to Ephesians 5, we'll notice that there's still a command there for the uh, earthly husbands to follow. Let's turn back to Ephesians 5.25. Ephesians 5.25, we read, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So, or in this manner, ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. So husbands are commanded to love their wives by doing the exact same thing that Christ did, by laying his life down uh, for their spouse. Uh, and this laying down of one's life was for a very specific purpose. Verse 26 tells us it was to sanctify and cleanse her. But how? with the washing of water by the word. Okay, so the role of the husband to his wife is foremost and primarily uh, the role of guiding and instruction, instructing his wife in the word of God. Um, the same way Christ guides and instructs his church, the elect. And I know some husbands may be thinking uh, this is easier said than done. I remember having a conversation with a couple of people actually and this is the current situation that they find themselves in, that their wives no longer perhaps want any guidance from someone who believes that uh, the Bible is teaching uh, that the church age has ended or that um, salvation had ended and or that, you know, or that uh, judgment is upon the world. You know, I was speaking with somebody about this and he asked me, how can I instruct my wife uh, if she wants nothing to do with me regarding the Bible? Well. I don't know that I completely know the answer to that question, but I do know that every command given by God uh, is not always easy to obey. And so the command for a husband to love his wife uh, and to lay down his life for his wife is no exception. Uh, our obedience as husbands um, was never conditional upon uh, the actions or reactions of our spouse. In other words, your obedience to God's commands uh, should, and should always be unconditional. Okay, it's true that those of you who are in this situation have it much harder to obey this command, but again, obedience was never an option. Uh, it was always a commandment. Uh, and this really is the meaning of love. Um, love is a work. It's a labor uh, that requires daily sacrifice on our behalf. Um, and our desire for our spouse would be that she would be holy and pure, just as that would be the desire for ourselves. So let's pick up again on verse 28. So, which means, uh, in this manner, ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth hims his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. So according to these verses, loving our wives also involves nourishing and cherishing them. Okay, and in order to know what these two words mean, we want to look them up. Uh, the word nourisheth is Strong's number G1625, and it's only used one other time, uh, and it, it's actually in the next chapter. So let's turn over to Ephesians 6 4. Ephesians 6, verse 4. There we read, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, uh, if you thought the word nurture in this verse is the word same word as nourisheth, uh, you'd be wrong. It's actually the word bring them up uh, that's translated um, as our word <coughs> nourisheth. Uh, and so this word stems from another word, which is Strong's number 5142, which is translated as feed, as nourish, and bring up. And so this really is the duty of a husband and a father. He feeds and he nourishes his wife and his children uh, with the Word of God. In other words, his primary task is to provide them with spiritual food, the same way God does for his elect. Verse 28 of Ephesians 5 uh, also says that he cherisheth her. 
the word cherisheth is Strong's number 2282. And this word also appears only one other time in the Bible. So if you turn to 1 Thessalonians 2.7, we can take a look at that. 1 Thessalonians 2.7. Actually, we'll start reading at verse 4 uh, down to verse 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth, and there's our word, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being effectually desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. So the ultimate desire of each true believer um, is for the salvation of others above themselves. Uh, God's people know that whenever the opportunity arises for us to share the gospel, it's we are never to do it by watering it down uh, for the sake of offending anyone. And that includes an unbelieving spouse. Uh, but when, the, when we share the gospel, we do it by cherishing our spouse. According to verse seven, this word uh, is used in the context of a nurse uh, caring for her children. And she does it with gentleness. And the word gentle is used in 2 Timothy 2.24. Uh, let's take a look at that. 2 Timothy 2.24 also instructs us how to bring forth the gospel. 2 Timothy 2.24 and 25. There we read. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, that is unto everyone, have to teach patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now you may be thinking that this verse no longer applies since God is no longer granting repentance, but you'd be wrong. Uh, you see, our obedience to God's commands were never dependent on circumstances that were outside our control. Um, as long as we're preaching the gospel, whether it was the gospel of salvation or whether it was the gospel of God's judgment, we're never to strive or fight with our words, uh, but we're always to be gentle in our declaration of the gospel, apt to teach and patient. Okay? In, and in meekness or humility, we were always to instruct those that oppose themselves, including uh, perhaps a spouse who uh, doesn't believe, whether or not repentance is being granted by God. See, Christ set forth that example as he loved us while we were yet still sinners, okay? And he laid his life down for us. Uh, and so we as husbands are expected to follow the same example that Christ set forth. Let's turn back to Ephesians 5.30. Ephesians 5.30, verse uh, 30 to 33. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as Christ, I'm sorry, so love his wife even as himself, and see that the wife reverence her husband. Okay, the great mystery here is that this is all uh, difficult parabolic language uh, when we read about the unity and the oneness between the elect and Christ and how that is represented by the earthly marriage between a husband and his wife. Uh, yet the parable um, that's displayed in our lives uh, is displayed in the life of each husband and wife. You know, when, we, when the husband and wife understand what their roles represent, then obedience to God's commands become much clearer. Um, now the word reverence used in verse 33 is the word fear, and it should read this way. And the wife see that she fear her husband. So in order to understand that, let's back up a few verses. Let's take a look at Ephesians 5.21. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to yourselves 
Submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. So when people look at passages like this at face value alone, they miss the greater spiritual meaning um, hidden in these passages. Verse 21 speaks about the, the husband and the wife submitting to one another uh, in the fear of the Lord. So the key phrase here is in the fear of the Lord, um, which means in obedience to his commandments. Let's take a look at Jeremiah 44.10. 